thank you to Lonnie Glass for that wonderful music interlude. So I hope you guys have your coffees or your teas and you're ready to go because I will now be passing it over to our presenters, Lily and Mina. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, this is our first time doing this, so bear with us. Um, my name is Lily. And I'm Mina, and we are the management team for the New West Farmers Market. So we're here today to show you some tips and tricks and free programs that you can use to help boost your farmers market online presence. We're mostly going to talk about social media and social media adjacent things today, but there'll be a small amount of dabbling in other web based tools as well. This workshop is going to cover a wide range of tools and topics in hopes that we would provide something for every skill level. Um, our hope is you'll find at least a few nuggets today that will help you up your game and that you can take home with you. And don't worry, we have a follow up email that will get sent out to you or actually um, we have a little um, like a handout with links that I believe is in Whova for this event. So you can take that home with you and then you'll have some more resources to go on from this workshop. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was at a workshop hosted by the city of New Westminster for local nonprofits. And at one point in the evening, an executive director of another New West nonprofit was asking for advice. She said, how is it that the only nonprofit in New West I always feel up to date with is the farmer's market? And I was super flattered, but I was also like, what are we doing? <laughs> and I'll tell you, we over communicate. Um, we show our faces, we are cute as heck, and we use a lot of handy free tools. If you don't use social media a lot for your market, it is easy to feel like it's not something you need to bother with. But as millennials, we are here to inform you that your shoppers are mostly from our generation and we use Instagram. As the world evolves, farmers markets must evolve with it. We got to keep up with the kids or the 30 year olds, as the case may be. I used to feel like social media marketing was intimidating and involved some sort of black magic I just didn't understand. But you know what? That's totally not true. There are many ways that we can boost our social media presence entirely for free. And today we will show you the programs that we use and give you tips on how to use them yourself, as well as overall best social media practices. I told my mom we were running this workshop and she told me that the worst workshops she's ever attended are lectures disguised as workshops. Sorry, mom. <laughs> um, to be able to get us all on the same page here today, we've got like a 40-ish minute lecture coming at you, but then we'll do some activities together and test out our new skills entirely based on time. So we'll just gauge how it goes. Um, plus, we want your questions, your inquiries, and your ideas throughout the presentation. Um, so feel free to interrupt. We've got Melissa and Talia here to help us manage questions. Um, but let's get ready. Uh, you can open up your own social media if that's an option for you and kind of follow along there. Or I have a slide deck for you that has screenshots as well. So you can also follow along there. So I'm going to share my screen now and we will get started. One second here. All right, let's go. Mina, can you see the slide deck? No, I just see you. Oh, good. Oh, wait, here. How about now? Okay. Um, I'm gonna. How do I make it not full screen for me? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yes, we see your slides. We see your slide deck. Okay. Um, you gonna hit present? I'm not going to, so that I can see the things on the side here and keep up. Okay. Cool. All right, so let's start with the super basics. So first up, uh, we're gonna talk about Facebook. And I'm sure that most of you know what Facebook is, but um, something that isn't as obvious with Facebook is that it actually has business tools for people who create business pages. And there's a lot of reasons why you wanna create a business page because once you declare yourself as a business or like create a business page for your business, Facebook, uh, gives you a lot of data about the audience that your page, um, the audience that interacts with your page and who interacts with your posts. And in return, your customers get to see lots of details about your market. 
such as like when and where it is. And then it can also provide a map so that they can uh, find your market easier. And um, what's fun is that they can actually even see how quickly you respond to messages when they send you Facebook messages. And um, one of the more important things is that you're going to get to see the insights to your audience. So what this means is that uh, you get to see like who is most active on Facebook, when they're most active on Facebook, uh, what their age or gender identity is, as well as which of your most are the most sorry, which of your posts are the most popular? So like which ones get the most engagement? And finally, something else that uh, Facebook business pages provide you with is the ability to pre-select commonly asked questions, which means that um, as I'm sure you guys all know, like you get a lot of the same questions over and over again, and you have to keep answering the same ones. And so what you can do is make it a commonly asked question and then pre-select an answer for it. And then that means that when somebody asks you that question, it gets automatically answered by Facebook and you don't even have to do anything at all. All right. So as Mina mentioned, one of the most useful things that Facebook has to offer is called insights. So if you do have access to the social media right now, I invite you to pull up your market's Facebook page um, if you have one and if you're able. If not, follow along with the slides. Uh, I have screenshots to show you exactly what we're talking about. So you can find your insights tab inside your business profile on the left-hand column. I have indicated it here with no less than three arrows. <laughs> if you have an active Facebook page where you receive regular responses, the insights are particularly useful because this is where you can see the data and stats about the people who interact with you. Uh, all right, so inside insights, if you choose posts on the left, you can see a section come up that says when your fans are online. This, in my opinion, is by far the most useful tool that Insights offers. By choosing different days, you can see the peaks and valleys of when people are most likely to interact with your posts. And this will help you choose when you want your posts to be published in the future. So in this image, we can see that the most popular times are between 6 and 9 p.m. Um, it looks like it peaks around 8.30. So this image is not ours, full disclosure, as it paints a better picture than our insights page does. So I wanted to give you a good example, um, but disregard the 14,000 interactions this person is getting because we definitely don't have that. Um, but this is your optimal posting time in that window when your post will be seen by the most people. So as we move on, don't forget about insights because we're gonna come back to it later. Um, so before we leave Facebook, let's talk about the FAQs that Mina mentioned. Uh, the frequently asked questions are, I don't know about you, but the most important thing, or one of the most important things to me, the amount of times I get asked in a week, when is your next market, or where is the market located, or how do I become a vendor, is staggering and a little annoying. <laughs> One of the easiest ways to combat these redundant questions is to put them in your Facebook page as FAQs. If you choose inbox in your profile from the left-hand column and then choose frequently asked questions in the middle column, you can then choose to edit them on the right. Um, and then once you choose edit, this is what it looks like. You have the opportunity to write your questions and responses in the center that I've uh, squared off there. And as you can see, our first question here is, when is your next market? Once you have these filled out and saved, the next time someone wants to message your business page to ask you a question, they'll be presented with these FAQs first, and it will look kind of like on the right-hand side there. And hopefully they'll answer their own question and give you some of your time back. So <clears throat> another useful tool is Instagram, which some of you are likely already using. But again, are you getting all that you can out of Instagram? So owned by Facebook, Instagram provides similar insights and business tools, but only if you declare yourself as a business page. So Instagram, um, I find tends to cater to a younger demographic than Facebook, but at you know, at this point, younger means mid thirties, which means that you definitely want to be communicating with this group. So when you make your page a business page on Instagram, you're provided with an overview of your account, again, with insights. And what you get to see is how many accounts you've reached, the amount of interactions you get, as well as the growth, number of follows and unfollows, the age range and gender identity of your audience. 
So if you have a business page, you can go ahead and go on your phone and pull it up or on your desktop. And then you can find your insights on your profile page above your post and below your bio. So by far the most important thing like on Facebook is the insights on Instagram. And here is where you get to see the times that your audience is most active uh, sorted by hours and days. And this is going to be the most useful thing that you use from Instagram insights because Again, um, this is what's called your optimal posting time. When you post during your optimal posting time, they are more likely to be seen, liked, commented by your audience. And then this level of engagement tells the Instagram algorithm to boost your content for more viewers. So when we talk about Instagram posts, uh, we're actually talking about three different ways to post on Instagram. The first is the most obvious. Um, it's the posts on your feed. The second is stories. And the third is highlights. Posts, obviously, are the ones that are on your wall that people will get to see when they click onto your profile. And they're there permanently until you decide to delete it or archive it. But the ones that we want to go more in depth in today are highlights and stories. So stories are the temporary posts that you can make on um, Instagram. Uh, you can access these by clicking onto your profile photo, probably on the top left corner. And then when you make a story, it stays viewable for only 24 hours from the time that you post it. So what this means is that they're very helpful to your social media presence because since they disappear, people are more likely to visit your profile more often just to avoid missing a story. So that adds a sense of urgency. And also, for some reason, we found that people kind of tend to respond to stories more often than with posts. Um, and that encourages more engagement with your audience. Um, we think maybe it's because the responses that they send are sent to you directly through the direct messages, which means it's a private response rather than one that people can see like publicly on your feed. So um, back to, or going on to highlights. Highlights are just stories that you have saved onto your profile for permanent viewing, again, until you remove it. So once you post a permanent, sorry, once you post a temporary story, you can then save it as a highlight. And these are accessed by clicking the little circles um, between your insights button and your feed. And these are really fun because you can get to be very creative with them. Uh, you can choose to save multiple stories as a collection of highlights, and then you can make a cute cover for it uh, for the collection, as well as a little title. So for us, uh, you can see in the red box, we have a a highlights collection with the cover being this cute little vegetable cartoon with googly eyes because it's part of our branding. And so we use them as our story covers. Uh, some ways that you can use your highlights can be for commonly asked questions, um, displaying some of the market's favorite products or some of your recent or past events. And it can even be used as a really awesome way to just introduce some of your staff or your vendors. When I first started managing the market social media, it took me a while to like find our voice. And so the posts from a few years ago are a bit all over the place, but now we've definitely hit more of our stride. And overall, we try to keep our Instagram posts visually light and bright with limited amounts of text and photos. Though there's usually a couple of words that we use kind of like a title and our posts are friendly and informative while celebrating food and the community. You want things to look cohesive, but you don't want them to look too perfect or otherwise it just doesn't look real and it's not accessible anymore. Something that I've been working on more is being aware of um, accommodating the visually impaired going forward. So by adding a description of the images into the caption and ensuring that any text in the photo is repeated in the caption. caption. When visually impaired Instagram or Facebook users are on social media, they have applications that read text to them. But of course, this doesn't include photos. So you always wanna make sure you're being inclusive and cater to different types of people. Since I started running the NUA socials, I also have learned some more things about Instagram that perhaps everyone else already knew or Mina did and I did not. <laughs> but in any case, if you're like I was, I just wanna point out to you two very useful and important things on Instagram before we leave. Um, firstly, you can share posts into your story um or somebody else's post or your own 
on the left here, you can see the paper plane looking icon that I have circled. By clicking this, you can post the post into your stories, which can either draw attention to new posts that you've put up and bring in a greater viewership because people are more likely to view stories than posts, or you can share from one of your vendors or elsewhere to your followers without storing it permanently in your feed. The other useful thing is the archive, which you can find under the three bars top right that looks kind of like a hamburger icon, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> and this is where you can see all of your old stories saved. I thought they were gone forever until Mina straightened me out. You're muted. <laughs> I am just full of Instagram tips. So. Um, one more before we leave Instagram is that Instagram is, um, it only gives you one clickable link, which is kind of pretty annoying, actually. So you can't provide links the same way that you can on Facebook or Twitter or in your email newsletters. When you post a link uh, on, your, on your post on your feed or in your comments, it isn't clickable. And that means that somebody has to manually take the time to copy it or, and then type it out character by character into the address bar. And I don't know about you, but I just, I just don't have the time to bother with that. So one way that you can utilize the one clickable link you have is the, sorry, the one clickable link that you have that you can put into your profile is that uh, you wanna use a landing page. And a landing page is just, um, a page that you go to where it has all of the links that you want available. And there are other um, kind of like programs or websites that you can use, um, such as Milkshake, but we like to use Linktree. So we're going to go into Linktree. So even though both of them are free and you can find other free alternatives as well. So with Linktree, uh, you can create a free account. And by creating a free account, you get access to two things. First is you get a customizable link to pop into your one clickable spot on your profile. And the second is that when you, when you or your audience clicks into it, you get to this interface that you can see where you can put as many links as you want. So what happens then is that when somebody comes to your profile and they cl click that one link, they will be taken to your landing page and then they'll see something like the screenshot here. And it's very easy to adjust these buttons from your end or to swap them out or to change the order of them as you want. And Linktree is actually a really common um, choice for a lot of businesses because it looks professional, it's very clean and it's very clear and easy to use. And it just has a whole bunch, sorry, it has a like group of all your links there for you. So next up in our recommendations, is Buffer. We understand that although life seems to revolve around social media, it doesn't and it shouldn't. So to avoid letting social media posts consume your life, we recommend using an app that schedules your posts for you. One of your favorite free ones to use or one of our favorite free ones to use is Buffer. So this is available for Android, Apple, and there's a desktop version. So I prefer to use the desktop version. It's bigger, it's clearer, and it's easier for me to use. Um, but Mina likes it on her phone so that she can schedule things when she's out or when she's on the couch and doesn't want to be at her laptop. I'm not judging. Buffer has a low learning curve and it's quite comprehensive, even for the free version. Although there is a paid version, like with most of the things we're going to show you today, um, that provides more tools. Personally, I have never felt compelled to upgrade with Buffer, um, but you can if you want and if you decide that that's useful for you. Um, with Buffer, you can prepare all of your weeks or months worth of posts at once and then schedule them and forget about it because they'll just post on their own. So this ensures you never miss one of those optimal posting times. I said we'd come back to Facebook and Instagram insights and now is that time. So when you use that information about when your fans are online, you ensure your posts are getting you the most bang for your buck or whatever. You use these times to create a schedule and buffer. And then when you create your posts, they just slot into this pre-created schedule. It's very easy. You schedule once and then you post forever. So an important thing to note is that you cannot schedule Insta stories through Buffer. That's a paid feature. And I've done a lot of research and there is no application that you can schedule stories through for free. So that is something that you would have to manually trigger. 
I recommend during an active season with a weekly market to post once a day. If you have an off season like we do right now, I would recommend reducing to twice a week. This way you're still on top of, uh, still top of mind for people, but you don't actually have a lot or new information to share. So it's excessive to post every day. Plus coming up with all that content is really rough sometimes when there's nothing going on. So another way that you can engage with your audience and boost your social media presence is by having a newsletter. So this might sound a little bit old fashioned, but newsletters are actually really great because you can deliver your information, your events and other messages of value just directly and straight to the inbox of your audience. A social media marketing professional once told us that your newsletter mailing list is one of the most valuable marketing commodities that you can have. And so with newsletters, um, they give an exclusivity feel to your customers and it helps to build a sense of community. But something that is really, really important about newsletters is that you have to, have to, have to get permission to sign people up. You cannot just take their email and just plug it into your newsletter list. Legally, you have to get their express consent before you can add them to your mailing list. So this can sound sound kind of intimidating, but you can actually get permission in a few different ways. For example, you can create a page where people can sign up and then you can encourage them to do so through social media that kind of like leads to your landing page, for example, or even through a pop-up on your website when they visit. And um, another way that you can do, another way that you can take advantage of is through like a raffle or like a draw that you might be hosting at your market. So just on your raffle slip, you can ask people for their email addresses and then you can include a checkbox where they can choose whether they want to sign up to your mailing list at the same time. This is very important. <laughs> Lily has read the CRTC anti-spam laws front to back and she assures us that you have to get express positive con consent from somebody in order for you to add them to your mailing list. You can't just like assume that they give you their consent just because they've given you their email address. You cannot be sneaky about it and say like, check this box if you do not want to be signed up for a newsletter because this is implied consent. Because if you do that, you are actually making the default option to subscribe to your newsletter. Whereas legally the default option needs to be not to subscribe to your newsletter. So um, another way that we try and encourage people to join our mailing list um, is you can create a magnet. So a magnet is an item that provides value to your customers and you send it directly to their mailing box in exchange for them signing up for your newsletter. So for example, uh, you would tell people if they sign up, they would get um, the top farmer's market recipes of the season or a cute chart of the produce that's in season sent right to your inbox if you subscribe to a newsletter. Um, you want to do this because it can add value and um, it gives them incentive for signing up for your newsletter mailing list. So with that, it leads us to what kind of software or program you might want to explore or use for your newsletters. So there's actually quite a few options um, out there that are free like MailerLite, but our favorite is MailChimp because the free option that they provide gives you up to 2000 free subscribers before you have to start signing up for their paid service. But even with their free option, you can check uh, the insights of your audience as well as how often your subscribers are opening and then clicking into your newsletters. Yes, more insights. This is important. Um, if you take a look at this at the slide, the screenshot there, this is important because um, for us, we have two audiences, which is MailChimp's vocabulary for mailing lists. Um, a free account actually now today only provides one for MailChimp, but our account is grandfathered in so that we still have two audiences that we can choose. And as you can see here, um, our members, members audience opens newsletters from us about 1.3-ish percent more than our regular subscribers, but our regular subscribers are almost twice as likely to click a link that's um, provided inside the newsletter. So with this type of information, you can then choose and decide um, what kind of events or information 
you want to send to which group or whether you want something that caters to both crowds. Because more insights just never hurts anybody. You can use it for like so many things. And MailChimp is great because it is actually super, super easy to use. Um, it has this builder tool that lets you build like really fancy looking emails and they're super professional and you don't even have to know how to code or even do like graphic design. You just select their boxes of information and then you drag it into your work area and then MailChimp just puts it all together for you. And what's even better is once you have created your professional fancy looking email newsletter, you can then save it as a template and then you can reuse and replace it uh, with new content. And so you never have to build another newsletter from scratch once you've made one to begin with. And another thing that's great about MailChimp is that they give you the option to schedule your newsletters. So just like with Buffer, um, we want to work smarter, not harder. So you can mass create all of your newsletters at once. Um, and then you can just forget about them afterward because they'll just send out all on their own. And then you just go and check your insights uh, whenever you want to create like new newsletters. Okay, on to the next free tool. So you'll hear people talk about surveys a lot often in conjunction with SurveyMonkey, but I am here to tell you that SurveyMonkey is not helpful at all. They suck, say it with me, but surveys are useful. We recommend using Google Forms instead, and I'll tell you why. You get an absolutely free piece of software that works so nicely with the rest of Google Suite, which sidebar, if you are not already familiar with Google Suite and using it regularly, you should be. And it provides you with very professional looking forms that you can add to your website, post on social media, or even put up the link on a, a sandwich board at the farmer's market so people can fill out the forms or surveys on their phone while they're there, or they could take a photo and do it at home. With Google Forms, you can get an unlimited number of responses. SurveyMonkey will charge you to access more than 100 responses. It allows you to collect emails, which can be useful for certain things, but once again, do not add these emails to your newsletter without expressly asking permission. And it creates a very easy to read Excel spreadsheet of responses if you want a way of easily saving or sharing your responses. You can find Google Forms inside of Google Drive. So I have a little screenshot there in the center. And on the right, is what a form would look like. Surveys are most useful when directed at two groups, your vendors and your customers. You can use surveys to find out more about your customers than social media analytics will tell you. For example, from our customers, um, uh, sorry, for example, um, do you come to the market alone or with friends and family? Do you come with a grocery list and stick to it? Or do you buy things based on what is in the market or what's in season? You can also use them as an opportunity to solicit customer feedback about the season as a whole. Um, this was particularly useful for us at the beginning of the 2020 season um, because everything was kind of scary. And we asked for a lot of feedback from our customers about safety and how they were feeling at the market. Because at the end of the day, customers feeling safe is as or more important than customers being safe. No matter how many safety procedures we put in place to follow our Fraser Health Directives, um, people, if people didn't feel safe, then we're not doing the right thing. So these kind of surveys are also useful as kind of a bit of a placebo to effect by giving people the opportunity to provide feedback, they get to feel important and heard. Surveys are also good to use with your vendors. You want them to feel heard as well, and you want them to know that you care about what they think. By sending out surveys to your vendors, you can ask for feedback at the end of the season, and you can get opinions on certain topics. Next up is graphic design. One of the most intimidating parts of social media and web, in my opinion, is good graphic design. Hiring a graphic designer is so expensive and Photoshop or other similar software can feel inaccessible and kind of scary. So that's where enters Canva. This free web software is so easy to use. It is has a paid version, which is, if you use their free version long enough, they'll offer you the paid version to like try it out for a month at a time. They've offered it to me three times in the last year. So they're very generous with it. Um, which means you get access to photos and fonts and features not available in the free version. But honestly, I don't miss them when the premium version expires. Using Canva, you can upload your own photos and edit them or add text. 
You can use stock images or something they called elements. So like small graphics and lines and arrows um, to enhance what you already have or build something new. It is extremely easy to use and makes it very simple to create professional looking images. Canva has pre-made templates for almost anything like a Facebook event banner or an Instagram story or even like raffle tickets. Or you can choose to make an image or graphic yourself using custom sizing or Canva has all the measurements for common items like Instagram photos, Instagram highlight covers. You can build anything. You can design printable posters, social media posts, logos, highlights, whatever. And it looks super professional. I designed signage to go on big sandwich boards at the market and they look very spiffy if I do say so myself. Important to note, um, elements from Canva are not all licensed for uh, commercial use. So this means that you um, can use them for promotional purposes, but you couldn't like put them on a t-shirt and then sell that t-shirt necessarily. You would need to look into the licensing on Canva elements before using them to make something to sell. I haven't ever taken a graphic design course in my life, but I have made a lot of great Canva, uh, content in Canva. Plus Canva saves all the photos you upload and previous designs, um, which means you can come back to them time and time again for new projects. And that's all in the free version. And like, we just love our free things. Um, another free photo editing, graphic design um, kind of app that you can use. It's called Snapseed. So Snapseed is a free app that is available for both Android and for Apple. And while it's not as comprehensive as Canva is for graphic design or for laying text or frames over your photo, it's a really handy mobile option for when you want to edit a photo, especially if you want to do it on the go. So one of my favorite features um, includes the heal tool which is just for blurring bits of photos to make them uh, look as seamless and as cohesive as they can be. And another one of my features that I just love is arguably its most important and useful tool, which is the ability to edit your photos just all on your phone. You can brighten, sharpen, or add shadows and just really enhance your photo quality. We often find that uh, we're taking a lot of photos at the market during the market and we're posting them on the spot to encourage more people to join us that very day, which means that Snapseed is a really great and easy way to take your social media photos from good to amazing and just to the next level right from your phone while at the market. So now that we've gone over some of the tools that we just love to use and are totally free, let's go over some best social media practices so that we can effectively use these tools. So in my opinion, the single most important thing you can do to make your social media effective when it comes to your market is give your market a face or two in our case, but no more than two because then it can kind of be confusing and you're basically running a Brady Bunch size staff on Instagram. Um, by giving your market uh, social media a human face, you humanize your market. So your customers and online audiences will start to know who you are and you'll get more engagement online and people will remember you. Every week at our market, we do Insta stories of who is joining us at the market that day. We start with a front facing kind of monologue bit of either Mina or I, where we always start with, hey, it's Lily or Mina, the newest farmer's market. And then we go and give some updates for the day, like how many vendors they can expect today, um, what the weather is like, or any new changes we've had, like uh, new PHO orders or contests we might be running. From there, we take pictures of every vendor that is at the market. In our case, that's usually about 44 vendors and tag them so that customers can find the vendor's social media profile and the vendor can uh, share your story to their story. Sometimes we even add a little note to make vendors seem more accessible and humanize them as well. Like one of our vendors got a new banner. So I noted in the Insta story, um, Carol got the slick new banner, tell her how good it looks. We also do front-facing monologue Insta stories um, where there, when there are important updates, like I did one for my living room when we decided we were going to have a last minute Christmas market, or Mina did one about the raffle we were running to raise money for our kids program. You can see that right here. <laughs> Um, by making you, the market organizers, known and visible to your customers, you create a neighborly environment that makes your market uh, feel relatable and fosters community. So write this down. 
Social media does not need to be slick or polished. The most effective social media is when you humanize your business or your market. You make mistakes. You goof around. You're just that friendly lady at the market. People see us at the market all the time and are like, you are the Instagram ladies. It, they recognize us and it makes us more approachable and it makes the market more approachable for potential new customers. If I could talk about anything forever, it would be this. But the most impactful thing you can do is show your face, be human, and befriend your customers and your audience. So this is a natural segue to talk about our highest performing posts. Historically, our highest performing posts, you know, outside of like free events and free things, have been the ones that feature animals or people. So you can see from the slide that our top nine posts in 2020 includes a post in which one of our volunteers found a pet budgie at the market and one where Lily was in the local paper. She's still a little bit sore that the budgie got more likes and engagement than she is and we try not to bring it up around her. But at the end of the day, people want to connect and they want to empathize. They want to feel like they have a relationship with you and with the market. And they also want adorable things like puppies or dogs or adorable budgies or whatever. And not shown on the screenshot is how much more engagement we get from Insta stories where we show our face. So like Lily mentioned, um, we like to show our faces even if it's just for a brief moment or for like a few sentences. And we assure you that when we do show our faces on our Insta stories and on our posts, we are always receiving messages asking questions about the market or just simply engaging with us. And sometimes they just message us just to tell us how much they love the market, which is actually really flattering because they don't even expect a response or anything. They just want to tell us that they love us. And it's really great. And so creating an environment like this that gets your social media audience to connect with you, it creates an emotional investment in your market and it breeds loyalty. And this is just a super effective, super easy and super important way to boost your online social media presence. So now that we all understand how useful and how important social media can be, um, we want to talk about how difficult it can feel when you're trying to look for content to post. Um, one of the most important things for your social media is your photos. They show your audience and your customers who you are and who, what you represent. And they say is a, like a photo is worth a thousand words or something like that. But that's only assuming you have photos to say those words. So I know that uh, we used to struggle with having new photos to use. Uh, we were like stealing photos from our vendors of their products and kind of just recycling that content. And overall, it was not as effective as it could be. So this is when we realized that we need to be prioritizing our photos. So you can always hire professionals to take great stock photos that you can use for years and years to come. And if you do that, we really recommend looking for like, um, student photographers or hobbyists because they tend to charge less, but you still get really professional results. But this is a workshop about free tools. So what we're actually going to recommend is that you can take your own photos. Now, if you don't take a lot of photos, it can be really easy to feel like you don't take anything that can ever be good enough. But we're here to reassure you that you are basically like a National Geographic photographer and you just don't know it yet. So. How do we do that? <laughs> we have adopted the slogan, always be taking photos because you never know when you might come across something that might be worthy of your social media and you don't wanna be like, oh God, that would have been great to post on our Instagram. But if you take a bajillion photos, at least two of them are going to be useful, right? I hope so, right? <laughs> but you really don't need a professional camera or lesson to take a decent looking photo. All you need is a decent kind of mostly up-to-date smartphone with a camera and a, an appreciation for good lighting and a commitment to regularly taking photos. Make a deal with yourself the next time you have a market. Take at least 10 photos every market. 
anything like the market overall, any guests or vendors or lineups that you might have, but take at least 10 photos, anything will do. And then you'll be surprised at um, the fact that you might actually have a few photos you'll really like. So here's a few tips for taking the best photo that you can with what you have. If you're outdoors, you want to try and take photos kind of near what's called the golden hour. Golden hour, um, as your market permits, of course, golden hour is right before sunset or just after sunrise, because that's when the colors are warm, very welcoming and very natural and flattering. If you're indoors, um, try and enhance your lighting. Use bright light and try and use indirect light because that's what is kind of the most flattering and will kind of show as much detail as possible. And another thing you want to take away is to try and have really high contrast in your photos. So for example, if you're taking a photo of your market outdoors, try and have like a crowd with like a bright like blue sky in the background or like capture a really colorful looking tent against a bright background or even just like if you're taking generic um, product photos, try and take a photo of like differently colored vegetables that are right after one, like one after another. And I know that it can be really difficult in the beginning and you're going to take like a hundred and not like any of them, but I promise that with more practice, you are going to eventually get the hang of it. So even with all that said, it can sometimes feel like you just never have enough photos and you never have enough content to post for how often you want to be posting or how often you feel you should be posting. But again, we are here to give you a tip on that. What one secret that like really kind of changed our social media that I'm gonna share with you is that you can use the same photo for different posts multiple times it's okay to recycle your photos. You can see here that we have actually the same photo and we used it for our Facebook banner as well as an Instagram post. And what we did basically to make it kind of look a little bit different um, was we kind of changed the filter, we played with the editing and made one brighter than the other. And then we put different text on it. So you can tell that uh, the one on the left has like, white text and it's like a little neater printing or writing font and the one on the right is like slanted and it's got a different like kind of different style to it um but overall just don't be afraid to use the same photo for different posts and um you can make little changes like cropping it differently putting different text on different style of text or editing it editing it differently and I promise you it'll be okay. A good photo is a good photo is a good photo and nobody is going to fault you for that. It's true. All right, here are our last hot photo tips. So when you're recording Insta stories, make sure you have the settings turned on to save them to your camera roll. This way you don't have to take a photo more than once. You crop that Insta story photo differently and use it somewhere else. And suddenly the same photo is pulling double duty, just like Mina said. We also recommend taking photos of products, customers, or several vendors at once. We have had experiences where vendors feel like we favored one vendor over another when it was more that one vendor had a more attractive table than another and it was easier to take a good photo of them. By keeping your photos more general, you don't run as much risk of appearing like you have favorites. I mean, we know you have favorites, but <laughs> you don't tell your vendors and you don't tell your children who your favorite is. Also, try to take photos that have some blank space in them so that you can add text without it being on top of a busy background. You can see an example of this on this slide. So the bottom is the original photo and the top I slotted in this very cute uh, graphic for Halloween. Make sure that if you run a contest or a raffle, take photos of your winners with their permission and post them to make sure that people know that somebody won those prizes. At the end of the day, just remember, always be taking photos. All right, so that is the end of our presentation today. Um, let's, we have a bit of an activity for you, but maybe let's just check and see if anybody has any questions before we walk away from here. Are there any questions, Melissa or Talia? 
Oh, I can't hear you, Melissa. Sorry. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. I'm just going to try and get a gallery view here. Oh, it looks like Patrick. Has or also put it. Perfect. Patrick. Hi. Uh, thanks so much. That was really great. I'm just wondering, uh, with posting photos of people at the market that you take, customers, vendors, um, is it okay to just post anybody's photo or is there legal or any reasons you can't? Do you have to get permissions? So an excellent question. Um, a good kind of reference point for 